let's start with the direct material variances. Now you'll see in the lecture notes I have included the formulas, but I don't want you to study formulas. I want you to follow a logical approach to all variance calculations. And the logical approach is as follows. First, we always start with the actual information, so the actual material cost. And you calculate the actual cost by taking the actual price and multiplying by the actual quantity. That will give you the actual cost of material. So always start with the actual. Then we change one thing at a time. And first we change the price. So you'll see the quantity remains the same. It's still the actual quantity. And the only thing I change is the price. So I'm comparing the actual price to the standard price. And if the only thing that I've changed is the price, and I'm comparing the actual price to the standard price, that is going to give me a price variance. Then once again, only change one thing. Keep the price the same. So we are working with the standard price. Keep the price the, ch the same and only change the quantity. Now if the price is the same and the only thing we've changed is the quantity, we are comparing the actual quantity to the standard quantity. And that is going to give us a usage variance. Or it's also referred to, you can see just below, as a quantity variance. Because the price is the same and the only thing that changes is the quantity. Then the sum of the price variance and the usage variance will give you the total material variance. All right. So don't study formulas. Follow a logical approach. Start with the actual. Change the price. That gives you a price variance. Change the quantity. That gives you a quantity or a usage variance. Now, let's say, for example, we have a situation where the company purchases 10,000 kilograms of material and they use 10,000 kilograms in production. So the actual quantity over here is obviously going to be the 10,000 kilograms that they purchased and used in production. Now the problem comes in where the company has inventory. So let's say, for example, they purchased 10,000 kilograms, but they only used 8,000 kilograms in production. So what are you going to use as the actual quantity in your calculation? Are you going to use the 10,000 kilograms that were purchased, or are you going to use the 8,000 kilograms that were issued into production? And the answer is, it depends on how the company values their raw material inventory. Now you can see just below, I've included the rule for you, but before we look at the rule, let's make sure that you understand the logic behind the rule. So please go to the journal entries on the next page. You'll remember when we looked at the aims of standard costing, in terms of IES 2, inventory can be recorded at standard cost as long as the standard approximates the actual cost. So we need to look at two different sets of journal entries. First, what happens if material is recorded at standard cost? Then, what happens if material is recorded at actual cost? All right, so let's first look at what happens if material is recorded at standard cost. First, we have the journal entry when the company buys the material. So what is your journal entry when you buy material? You're going to debit the material, and you're going to credit either the creditor or bank, depending on whether you pay cash or it's on credit. Now, it's important to note that you are always going to credit the creditor or bank with the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased. The supplier of raw materials doesn't care how you value your inventory. They want you to pay the amount that's on the invoice, the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity that you purchase. So you will always credit the creditor or bank with the actual amount as per the invoice. However, in this situation, we are dealing with material being recorded at standard cost. So when you debit material, you can't record material at the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased, but instead, material is recorded at the standard price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased. Now, even though we don't have amounts over here, you can see we don't have amounts over here, obviously, if you are debiting material with the standard price, and you are crediting the creditor or bank with the actual price, these amounts over here are going to be different. And the reason for the difference is because of the material price variance. So it's important to note, if material is recorded at standard cost, the price variance arises on the date of purchase. 
So that means when we are calculating this material price variance, it's going to be based on the quantity purchased and not the quantity that's used in production. Then next we need to look at the journal entry when the material is taken out of the storeroom and issued into production. So the journal entry is always to debit work in process and to credit material. So take it out of material and take it to work in process. Now material has been recorded at the standard price. So you take it out at the standard price. But obviously this is not going to be based on the quantity purchased. When you are recording the materials that are issued into production, this is going to be based on the quantity that's actually issued into production. So it's the standard price multiplied by the quantity issued into production. Obviously, there'll be a balance then sitting in material inventory. So if, for example, if the company did purchase 10,000 kilograms and they are only issuing 8,000 kilograms into production, then you'll still have 2,000 kilograms sitting in material. All right. So that's obviously the logic over there. Then, the debit to work in process is always the standard price multiplied by the standard quantity. So now again, we don't have any numbers over here, but you can see these numbers will definitely be different because this is the standard price multiplied by the actual quantity, and this is the standard price multiplied by the standard quantity. Now, the prices are the same. The only thing that's different is the quantity meaning this gives us the quantity or the usage variance. So the difference over here is your usage variance. Now, the usage variance arises when the material is issued into production. So the usage variance is going to be based on the quantity issued into production or the quantity used in production and not the quantity purchased. Alright, so that deals with if material is recorded at standard cost. Let's look at what happens if material is recorded at actual cost. So first, the journal entry when we purchase material is to debit material and credit creditors or bank. And remember, regardless of whether the company records material at actual cost or standard cost, you always need to pay the supplier the actual amount. So you're always crediting the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased. Now, in this scenario over here, material is recorded at the actual cost. So when you debit material, it's not the standard price, but the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased. So now you can see both of these amounts over here are going to be exactly the same because both of them are based on the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity purchased. So there is no price variance on purchase. So let's see what happens when the material is issued into production. Then obviously we are taking it out of material, so we credit material, and we debit work in process. Now, in this situation, material is recorded at the actual price. So you take it out at the actual price, not the standard price. Obviously, it's recorded at the actual price, so you take it out at the actual price. But you take out the quantity issued. So if they purchased 10,000 kilograms and they only issue 8,000 kilograms into production, that means we still have 2,000 kilograms sitting in material. All right. So take out the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity that they issue into production. Then we always debit work in process with the standard price multiplied by the standard quantity. So obviously, this is based on the standard price multiplied by the standard quantity. This is the actual price multiplied by the actual quantity. Those amounts are going to be different. And the reason for the difference is your material price variance and your material usage variance. Because you'll remember, there was no material price variance on the date of purchase. So both the price variance and the usage variance 
arise when the material is issued into production. That means in this situation over here, the price variance is not going to be based on the quantity purchased. It's going to be based on the quantity used or issued into production. So the price variance arises when the material is issued into production, not on the date of purchase. So that means the actual quantity is going to be the quantity used or issued into production. But it's important to note, regardless of whether the material is recorded at standard cost or actual cost, the usage variance always arises when the material is issued into production. So the usage variance is always based on the quantity used or issued into production. So now that we've covered the logic, you can go back to the rule on the previous page. What if the actual quantity of material purchased is different to the actual quantity of material that is used in production? What actual quantity are you going to use when calculating the material price variance? So for now, please note we are just looking at the material price variance because remember we said, regardless of whether material is recorded at standard cost or actual cost, the material usage variance is always calculated using the actual quantity that is used or issued into production. However, the price variance is sometimes calculated based on the quantity purchased and other times calculated based on the quantity used or issued into production. And that depends on whether material is recorded at standard cost or actual cost. If material is recorded at standard cost, the price variance arises on purchase. So the actual quantity is the quantity purchased. And this is referred to as a purchase price variance. On the other hand, if material is recorded at actual cost, the price variance does not arise on the date of purchase, but instead the price variance arises when the material is issued into production. So the actual quantity is going to be the quantity issued or used in production. And that is referred to as an issue price variance. So it's very important if you have a situation where the actual quantity purchased is different to the quantity that was used or issued into production, you need to determine where the material is valued at actual cost or standard cost because that is going to affect the calculation of your material price variance. But please note, it will only affect the calculation of your material price variance. The usage variance is always based on the quantity used in production. If the question is silent, you can assume that material is recorded at standard cost. And obviously, if it's recorded at standard cost, that means the actual quantity should be the quantity purchased. So the material price variance should therefore be calculated using the actual quantity purchased. Alright, so so far we've looked at how you calculate the material price variance and the material usage variance. However, it's important to note if more than one material input is used in the production process and that material can be used interchangeably. So in other words, the one material can be used as a substitute for the other. Then it's possible to take the material usage variance and split it into a mix and a yield variance. All right, so let's consider an example over here. Let's say we have a company that makes biscuits, and two of the materials used in the baking of biscuits is oil and milk. And I want you to assume that those ingredients can be used interchangeably. So, for example, if we use less oil, we can use more milk. And if we use less milk, we can use more oil. So because they can be used interchangeably or as substitutes for each other, it's possible to take the material usage variance and split it into a mix and a yield variance. 
However, you need to read the information provided very carefully. You might have a situation where the material can't be used interchangeably or as a substitute for each other. So let's say, for example, we have a company that manufactures cars. You can't have two steering wheels instead of one steering wheel and a front bumper, for example. So that's an example where the front bumper and the steering wheel can't be used interchangeably. The one can't be used as a substitute for the other. And if you have a situation like that, you can only calculate the usage variance in total, and you can't split the usage variance into a mix or a yield variance. So always read the information provided very carefully. However, it's important to note if the question is silent, you can assume that the material can be used interchangeably. So what I mean by if the question is silent is let's say they just call the material material A and B or material X and Y. So you don't actually know the nature of the material. You can then assume that the material can be used interchangeably and therefore the usage variance can be split into a mix and a yield variance. Now it's important to note we have already looked at the calculation of the material usage variance. So we have already looked at both of those amounts there, how you calculate that usage variance. So there's only one new calculation that we need to look at in order to split the usage variance into a mix and a yield variance. But I'm going to go through this in more detail when we actually look at a lecture example.